Yeah. This one was fun. initiation of motion, brought initiation of motion into bedrock erosion, which is what I had to try to figure out for your quizzes. Uh, you know, can, can the Missoula slides rip up rock? Duh. Yeah. Um, but can you rip up rock at the same time that you're depositing somewhere else? Yeah, it's that other place that's got shallow enough flow. Um, but I want to go from there into talking about channel networks and longitudinal profiles of rivers. I think we've got the tools now to ask, to answer some of the key questions that we need to get at in order to get to what's up with channel networks. Um, specifically, I want to start with a few questions. So, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for a channel head? Or for a channel more, uh, well, and even for a channel downstream of the channel head. But let's, in particular, start our consideration at that point. So, when, and when I say necessary and sufficient conditions, I say, well, what do we need? And is that enough? Okay. And then, okay, even if we can say what does that, what makes us have a channel, why do channels form branching networks? And there are a lot of branching networks, our, the veins in our veins and arteries in our bodies, uh, the veins on a leaf, channel networks. These all have similar sort of branching patterns kind of similar anyway. Um, what's up with that? I mean, it's, it's reasonable to ask that question. And then what do the answers to those first two questions tell us? Maybe, I mean, hopefully, if we go through all the trouble of going into channel networks, what's up with that? Maybe that'll actually help us out with some other questions as well, uh, such as, you know, how high do mountains get? How, why do mountain ranges get? How long does it take for mountains to get as high as they're going to get? And that kind of thing. Um, and what are the time? Yeah, what are the time scales of that? And another question is, okay, so how long does it take mountains to reach like their height and width and so on? Why do they last so friggin' long? I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, and so based on what we've learned so far, I think we should be able to answer at least that first question. That is, what's, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for a channel head? And then we'll go from there. Okay. So um, what do we need? Well, we need water, right? So and we, we talked about that. So we need at least some surface. and. We called it overland flow. And we talked about <coughs> infiltration excess overland flow, the kind you get in parking lots and city streets and roofs. Uh, but we also talked in more depth about saturation overland flow. Because that's, you know, that's kind of more common. At least, you know, soil is a common thing. And wherever we've got soil, we typically also have overland flow. 
I mean, saturation over length flow. So, um, now, how did we get that? We said that um, the, the water, for saturation over land flow, the water needs to overflow the capacity of the subsurface to carry it. And we got there by saying, okay, well, I've got a discharge due to rainfall. And I'm going to set that equal to the capacity for the subsurface to carry it according to Darcy's law. And that led us to saying, okay, well, I'm going to get overland flow where the rainfall, and actually where I'm going to get overland flow is not so much where they're equal, but where the rainfall is greater than the capacity of the subsurface, right? I mean, to do the algebra, sometimes it's convenient to just set it equal. That way we don't have to worry about which, you know, flopping our, our thing, our <laughs> Flopping our thing, but flopping the uh, greater than or equal or less than sign around. But um, let's be clear about that for now. So we need, uh, you know, the precipitation and contributing area to be greater than what we permit according to Darcy's law. And I'll write the um, I'll sort of skip to the more convenient version for us, where. I've replaced the, si the negative sine theta with, uh, with the slope, which is down defined as downward, down downhill positive, right? So S equals the negative of the, of the slope. So in this, so what is this? Saturated hydraulic conductivity, right? Soil depth, I'll write that on here because we use H for a bunch of things, and I'll use it for a different thing because that's the way it goes. Uh, the width and the slope. Um, it's, if I wanted to uh, say solve that for the topographic part of the conditions for overland flow, um, then I could, then it Let's try this, see if this makes sense to you. Because um, just a little bit of rearranging, and I can say, okay, ratio of contributing area per contour width to the slope needs to be greater than the saturated hydraulic conductivity times the soil depth divided by the precip. This is sometimes known, this product, the KSAT times the soil depth, is sometimes known as transmissivity. So it has units of length squared per time. This precipitation has units of length per time. Similarly, over here, we get units of length. So we've got units of length on both sides. So this is sort of a, a topographic indicator of some kind of length scale that we need to generate overland flow. But one of the things that we might notice about it, of course, you know, more likely to get flow when we have greater contributing area, that is, you know, more, more room to gather precipitation, but that it goes inverse with the slope. Simply because, you know, steeper places the water flows through the subsurface more quickly, right? So uh, we're favoring surface flow with a lower topographic gradient in this case. And that runs counter to some other things that we'll talk about next. So, um, so we need flow, but is overland flow sufficient? I mean, it could be sitting in a puddle, not doing anything, or barely moving, right? So, the yeah. So the existence of overland flow doesn't imply that we've got the ability to carve a channel. So we talked already about competition between hill slope diffusional processes and fluvial processes. We know that the water must at least carry away what, say, the gophers supply. Previously, we looked at briefly at stream power, simply a, defined as the rate at which potential energy of water sitting up high 
is converted to kinetic energy as it moves downhill um, per distance travel. So we might suppose that some of that energy could go into carrying sediment. Um, okay, but it's not clear how that gets us a channel, really. Um, and personally, at least for me, stream power is not an intuitive concept in terms of, well, I want to pick up that rock, what do I need to do it? Um, or I need to rip up that grass. So in order to carve a channel, we need to rip up whatever's in the way of forming that channel. And that could be grass, it could be tree roots, it could be dirt, or it could be rocks. And it could be intact rock, right? It could be bedrock. So for ripping up stuff, for picking up particles, we got to turn to trusty old shear stress, right? So in addition to our overland flow, we need some boundary shear stress or bed shear stress. So for particles like sand and gravel and boulders, we have a way to determine whether they're likely to move, which I hope you have all figured out very well. Because you just turned in quizzes where you had to do that. So we use then a modified shields diagram to find the critical shields number for a given particle size and density and planet. And then we calculate the shields number for the flow and particle and we compare the we compare the, the shields number and the critical value, right? So for 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 our shear stress, we said, well, we've got to go in terms of particle motion for uh, tau star. And I'll go ahead and, and note that, well, we remember, so that's a dimensionless shear stress. And for uniform steady flow, it has a nice convenient form, which is just the flow depth times the slope divided by the relative submerged specific density and the grain diameter. So I'll write here also though this is this particular age is flow depth. Just so we're clear about our different ages. Because otherwise I gotta get creative and figure out other letters to use and it's not up for that right now. Alright, so so we said, okay, it's a go if this is greater than that lookup value of the critical value, or the, the critical shields number, which for any kind of gravel greater than what, I think it was eight centimeters or so, is gonna, for that basalt in, in, uh, in Moses Cooley, is gonna be about 0.03. Um, and you know, for, for uh, to be real certain that it's going to move it, we, we wouldn't, you know, it'd be nice if it were actually quite a bit larger than 0.03. Point, you know, that is a fuzzy, a fuzzy criterion, right? Fuzzy in the sense that if it's just barely 0.03, you know, we might move after a while if we wait long enough and are patient and watch it. Boost that up by a factor of two or so and, and we can start being pretty sure stuff's going to move. All right, um, so now we're getting somewhere, I think. Um, because one of the things we see here is that whereas over here, the thing that I had to give me more flow, and I could put the precip up here, but the, you know, more, more flow, more, more contributing area, more flow in the numerator, but slope in the denominator over here, the thing giving me more flow is h, more flow depth, and slope is in the numerator with it. So that's, at least for a geek like me, that's a little bit interesting, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're not completely consistent with one another. Um, all right, is that now sufficient for a channel? Maybe, well, let's at least consider this. We, we also have to carry away whatever we move, you know, whatever. So 
Shear stress will do that too, though. Um, so the remote, the, 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 the most robust transport formula for relatively large transport rates uh, goes something like this. So we need to transport our thing that we move. And for that, and this could be a volume rate or a mass rate, it's not really important for, for what I'm going to write. Um, that it's going to be proportional through, and I got super creative and came up with a capital G for this, so don't ask me why. Um, but again, we go back to Shields number and critical Shields number. And we just raise that to a power of three halves. That's like the first sediment transport formula that anybody learns. Um, doesn't work well in all situations, but it works pretty well for relatively high transport rates. Um, but important bit being that, well, just like we needed a certain amount of shear stress to simply budge something, in order to carry it, we also need shear stress. But we do find that it goes to something like the three halves power instead of proportional. Okay. Um, so let's think about whether that's enough. Um, let's look at some actual examples. Is G a variable, or is that just like a? It's just a. It's just some constant instead of. I mean, it, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's. It, okay, it's gonna. Can, what's it gonna have? <laughs> it's gonna have all the things that aren't in there otherwise. But you know, cause it could be dependent on grain size. Although there is grain size in the shear shield number. Um, so. Um, all right. Pretty sure I've shown you this place before. This is West Bijou Creek in Colorado, as it says right there. And what do we see? Um, we, well, we've got evidence, it appears anyway, that the flow is ripping out the grass. Show a, another picture as well. Uh, in some ways I like the other one, but you can definitely see for here. For example, here there are two of these steps where the, the grass is getting ripped out. Um, the grass, but the, the, well, what it looks like is it's kind of curious because the, the shear, it, it appears as though the shear stress, in particular where it's capable of ripping out the grass, is not continuous. That is, there's at least a couple of places where it's ripping out the grass, but everywhere else there's grass growing. There's grass growing on top of where it's getting ripped out, and there's grass growing down below. So that's a little interesting. That's kind of interesting. Um, so then the flow is, of course, intermittent because it's dry right now, or when I took the picture. Um, all right. Um, So what we can see there is that uh, we can carve a channel network even if the shear stress necessary to do that basic thing of ripping out the grass first is intermittent and discontinuous. Um, and even if some of the shear stress is applied to the dirt sort of in this way where we might have a plunge pool and scouring back like this as in this Niagara Falls diagram. And you know, I know it's maybe a, a stretch to go from here to Niagara Falls, but all right. Um, about here. So here we've got. Uh, put up here, and I guarantee you, like none, none of these Scottish words are pronounced anything like they look. Um, so just try something. I'll say River Elk Hank. Carrying up Lewisian nice to downstream of lake, 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 Okay. Um, so uh, when it comes to carving channels in bedrock, uh, the shear stress to tear out blocks and carry them seems sufficient. Um, 
here's my Scottish River, Scot Scottish River. Um, and, you know, in order to keep that channel going, this is Lobster Creek in the Coast Range where we can see the boulders just sort of bleeding out of the banks here. Um, one day, one day if they're lucky and good, you know, taken away downstream by the river and carved up into cobbles. Um, so, we might, though, start to question that sufficiency of just simple shear stress or even transport capacity where ablation, abrasion plays a role. Um, and I don't know if, you know, here it's a bit ambiguous. Um, and um, graduate student, uh, day after New Year's Day up in the Coast Range, beautiful day for hydrologist types. Um, and you can see the water rushing down the bedrock at this junction of, of very headwater streams and very steep country up there. Um, so, yeah. Um, here's a spot, you know, way up in the Oregon Coast Range, way up in the headwaters. Um, and so for this network, carbon tie sandstone mechanism for eroding the bedrock is a little less clear. Could be some plucking. Um, we do see some steps all the way up here. Uh, there are some jagged edges where it looks like some exfoliation sheets might have been ripped out. Um, but maybe also some abrasion. Um, and uh, here's a hell of a nick point in, uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, got lots of these streams that are sort of coming over the surface of the shield volcano and plunging into this giant plunge pool thing. Um, and, you know, there could definitely be some plucking going on here. I mean, it looks like up here there's maybe some pluckable bits. Um, but abrasion looks pretty important here, too. I mean, these, uh, these carved out channels look awfully abraded to me, to my eye at least. So, come on, Holden, get with the program. <laughs> so what else might be necessary in order to do abrasion, for example? And we talked about it a little bit. Yeah, we, yeah, we did, last time we did talk about that a bit. Um, if I'm going to write up just like one more thing, what, what, what would it be? Well, yeah, but that's kind of implied, just the time to do it, but, um, all right. What, what polishes that rock? What carves out those potholes? Tools. Tools, yeah, we need tools. And by tools, I mean, essentially sand and gravel. Or abrasion. I'd say definitely for abrasion. Maybe we need tools for plucking too to do the what do we call it hydraulic fracturing. It wasn't fracking exactly. Hydraulic wedging. Hydraulic wedging, exactly right, where the pieces of gravel get sort of wedged into the cracks as the uh, as they open and close and sort of propagates those cracks. Um, so. So yeah, we do need tools to do abrasion, and I, uh, I should have shown you the one slide. I'll go ahead. We'll just camera this show in this picture. That would have been a giveaway, of course. Right, we can see here, um, well, she's holding a cobble that she plucked out of the bottom here, and there are other cobbles that she's standing on. There's sand in there. So it appears that the stirring of the cobbles is sort of grinding down the bottom of the pothole, and the, sand flinging out around uh, out from the vortex is probably widening it out at least up to you know up to that kind of height um, so yeah we need the tools now um, 
we actually kind of already took care of that in a way with transport. Because if we had the greater capacity to transport sediment, then we also are going to be carrying more tools. At least probably. And then thereby generate more collisions of those tools against the bedrock to break out all those bits. Okay, so if we look again at these conditions, then are we comfortable that these are necessary and sufficient? First of all, because we've got things we need, is that all we need? Personally, I'm comfortable with this list. Um, so if we look at that, um, we see that we've got three things that involve shear stress and one thing that involves just some flow. You know, we, so we need the flow, we need that flow to generate shear stress by flowing downhill. Um, now, is one of these the controlling factor? And I ask because of where slope shows up in the two conditions. Again, that this here slopes in the denominator, here slopes in the numerator. And so, you know, if we're trying to get the greatest value of one of those things, we can't get like, the greatest value of the other, right? So, um, now lower slopes, of course, they favor overland flow, but greater slopes favor shear stress. Um, somebody just, did I hear somebody say, do a mass balance? <laughs> I think yeah, I think that's it. So, I'm always happy to oblige there. Let's do a mass balance. This one won't be so hard, though. All right, so got a channel. Let's make it a bedrock channel, keep things kind of simple. Um, all right, so water, bedrock. Uh, I'll indicate there could also be a tributary here. I don't know how to draw it other than an arrow because, you know, the dimensionality. Yeah. All right. So, uh, and if I just draw this box, um, so, my, so up here I'm going to have some sediment flux. Call it Q sub S. I'm going to have uh, water flow. Call it Q. If this is my position x and that's x plus delta x, then I've got each of these at x. I've got the same quantities but different values of quantities at the downstream boundary x plus delta x. And I'm going to have some uh, little bits uh, coming in here too. I don't know, maybe those are beside the point almost, though, because um, if I'm really just concerned about whether I, well, what's the deal with a bedrock channel? Um, then we really, we want to conserve the mass of this column of rock, right? So if I do that, then, and let's say it's a place where we might actually have some rock uplift. So if I've got my elevation here, Z, I gotta say, well, I might have some rock uplift. Call it U. Boy, that's an awful U. Let me make that a little better. Okay, so I've got my rock uplift 
Um, I've got some erosion, and I'll call that capital E. These are the same variables used in the book. Because I didn't want to use U, because we use that for velocity of water, but this U is for rock uplift. Okay. Um, let's look back at that. Uh, Look back at that Oregon Coast Range slide, partly because I get to show you how I torture my grad students, but I don't think I actually had him sign a waiver. <laughs> All right. Um, so one thing to note about this, and you know, if we're going to do our mass balance, we want to make sure we incorporate what's important to this process, but obviously wherever we can make things simpler, we should. And one thing I notice is that I can see the rock. It's a rainy day, rainy, you know, it's okay. <laughs> so rain here, drinking water, because we just hiked up that mountain, you know, all that way from the outlet. Um, but I can see the rock, and so it doesn't appear that it's carrying anything like as much sediment as it could. Moreover, it's so wicked steep, if I put like even a chunk of gravel on there, that water's gonna whip it away pretty easy. So in this sort of situation, it might be reasonable to assume that I've got greater transport capacity than is being used. And maybe then I don't need, maybe, maybe then I don't need, well, okay, like I said, maybe the sediment flux and the water flux here are kind of irrelevant to, to things. Yeah, maybe I can get away with something a hell of a lot simpler by just saying, okay, my change in elevation with time is uplift minus erosion. I like that. That's simple. You might like that too. I don't know. It'll get more complicated. Don't worry. But right now it's pretty simple. Um, now, this, you know, we can leave up to folks like Andrew sitting back there, but I, you know, tell us about uplift rates and so on, but the erosion, you know, okay, that's worth, let's consider. What, what do we put there? Well, now I could put in shear stress, of course, um, or maybe shear stress to the three halves power. Uh, all right, well, let's, let's see. So we know that boundary shear stress for uniform steady flow, density of water times gravity, flow depth, and slope. Um, now, without getting too awfully into the math here, um, that's flow depth. All right, quick quiz. Uh, if I've got more discharge, does flow depth increase or decrease? It's not hard. Increase. Increase, right? Okay, good. So, if I, if I crank up the flow volume, the depth is typically going to get bigger, right? I'm going to get deeper flow and all that good stuff. Um, so flow depth increases with discharge, and here's where we get back to contributing area, because discharge increases with contributing area. Now, whereas when we were looking at saturated overland flow, we just said, Flow is proportional to contributing area. I had to qualify that and say, imagine that it's been raining forever. Because realistically, you know, it doesn't rain forever. It rains for some period of time. I get a, a bump in my discharge, but maybe not exactly proportional to contributing area. All right, that's, that's you know, we can, 
again, I don't want to get too deep into the math, but I can't necessarily just replace discharge with contributing area. I might need to fuss with that a bit. Um, all right, well then, if I don't want to get too awfully into the math, let's come up with a math that is at least relatively simple. Or, and or nice and general. So, again, I'm looking at shear stress, I'm going more flow, more shear stress, more slope, more shear stress. Um, might not be quite that simple, so let's, instead of saying E equals shear stress, let's just say that E equals something general that we can work with. All we're saying is erosion is going to be greater if we have greater contributing area and greater slope because we're going to say M, M and N are positive constants. More parameters. Okay. Um, and while it may be more complicated than that, this also might do for at least some purposes. Um, and what do I mean by that? And here's where we get to, well, okay, why branching and so on. Give me a sec here. And we'll go something you have actually seen before. rounding the slopes, but it just has a simple thing saying erosion is proportional to contributing area to a power and slope to a power. In this particular case it says that the exponent on slope is 0 0.5 and the exponent on, no, gosh, uh, the exponent on contributing area is 0 0.5, the exponent on slope is 1. Which, is, which are reasonable values physically and also convenient for computation. So that as much as anything is why I chose those numbers because the model runs better that way. Um, but what do we see here? Well, first of all, even just that initial random surface had a branching network to some degree because I, I sloped that initial plane and just random, the random perturbations that I put on there said, okay, well, water is going to gather and I can calculate the water flowing to every point and I sort of force it to drain by having an algorithm in there that simply forces it to drain. If it ponds up, then let it pond up, but overflow that pond. So I start with some initial, you know, kind of random aggregation of flow, and that turns out to be enough. I mean, I didn't even really need to do that, actually. All I, let me start it over. Because here's the point. Um, if I say that the erosion rate increases with contributing area, 
then places with more contributing area might erode a little bit faster. And if they go down a little bit faster than their neighbors, then they're going to increase their contributing area, and it's a positive feedback. And the only thing that kind of arrests that positive feedback is the tendency for the smoothing processes to smoothen out the little itsy bitsy carved bits. And then it's got a thing for slope in there. Now, what ends up happening then is, okay, you know, down here, and especially where this uh, inlet and outlet stream comes out here, um, if we were to look, and you might, you know, you can infer this simply by looking at it to some degree, that the little streams are steep, the big ones not so much. Now, I should, I actually lied, there's more, th more here than just that erosion is, has diffusion and the, the contributing area and slope thing. Because uh, there's also a base level that's held constant here while everything else is jacked up a little bit every iteration. So we, we're creating a bit of a slope at the bottom that can then propagate up through the system like a nick point and thereby carve out the drainage node. And what you'll perhaps also notice is that when this gets to the end of its of running and the drainage divides sort of calm down, and even before the drainage divides totally calm down, the mountains aren't getting any higher at some point. Right? I mean, I told you, I'm, I'm you know, it would be hard to make it otherwise almost, to make it so that, <laughs> yeah, gee. Um, so what we've got there is eventually what, uh, well, we've got uplift, we've got erosion, and what's my DZDT at the very end? Equal. Mountains aren't getting any higher. Zero. Zero. Yeah, yeah. But by the end, I've reached so-called steady state where my mountains aren't getting any higher and uplift balances erosion. So is uplift still continuing to happen? It's just negated by the amount of erosion that's happening? Exactly. Or we're talking yeah. like... Yeah, so what we're, not, what, we're, what we're not looking at is that the same, I mean, if this were a real thing, right? It wouldn't be that there's the same stuff here through time it's that the rate at which that surface is lowering is matched by the rate at which it's being fed from below. And that's analogous to any active margin, any place where we've got ongoing orogeny, you know, where we're actively we've got active tectonics, uplifting rocks, and surface processes to wear down the other bits. Yeah. Is there um I guess across different drainage systems, is there a specific amount of time that it takes for U to equal E? Yeah. Yeah, there is. And that's we're going to have to get to next time, because I did promise Andrew I'd leave him some time to talk to you all alone. But, yes. Have we reached that point in the coast, or is the coast still yes. up if it has? Yes. And I'll give you a hint before I stop. You can tell how long it is by looking at Taiwan. Because Taiwan has a sort of super convergence, right? You've got older convergence at the top of the island, younger convergence at the bottom. Yet most of the island is uniform width until you get to the bottom and it tapers to a point. So however long it took to get from that point up to where it starts being equal. What constant width? That's about the time. And I'll just go ahead and give you the answer. That's four million years in Taiwan. Uh, which again is kind of curious because we have mountains in this country that are hundreds of millions of years old. I was just in Scotland where the last active 
orogeny was Caledonian, which is like, I mean, if you if you go all the way to to the Pluton formation, then that that stopped four four hundred million years ago. Yeah, you still got some pretty steep mountains. So, oops. <laughs> so uh, that's something that we'll have to wait till next time. And I got to remember to shut off the camera before I leave.